A chase ensues. A dashing man drives a beautiful car, racing through the Swiss Alps. A scene, a spy, and a vehicle all so iconic they would change film history forever. The name is Bond. James Bond. And he wouldn't be 007 without his Martin. Aston Martin. James Bond is an iconic character because of his charm, spy skills, style, and yes, his cars. But not just any cars, the 007 cars. Sure, Bond has driven his share of Subarus and Toyotas, but the ultimate Bond car, the go-to for any British spy worth his salt, is Aston Martin. A car so linked with the Bond franchise that when they don't feature the car in Bond movies, sales actually go down. Forget Dom Toretto and Dodge, James Bond and Aston Martin is the most successful car partnership in film history. But what started this friendship? And was it always smooth sailing? How did the Bond franchise affect the business dealings of Aston Martin? And how did Aston Martin affect the Bond franchise? And why was Roger Moore the only Bond to never drive an Aston Martin? Today on the podcast, we're taking our martinis shaken, not stirred, as we load up on gadgets and embark on a secret mission to learn everything we can about James Bond and his cars. The show is gas. Pass gas. Pass gas podcast. It's about cars. It's not about ports. Big thanks to Blackview for sponsoring this episode. Have you ever worried about your car when you leave it for valet parking or when you bring it to a shop or dealership? With Blackview DR750X 2CH LTE Plus, it's not a concern anymore. I really want a dash cam. In fact, I want this Blackview dash cam. This dual channel Blackview dash cam comes with both front and rear cameras. You can enjoy clear image quality day and night thanks to the full HD Sony StarViz image sensors at a wide 139 degree view angle. Blackview's newest LTE dash cam is what you really need if you're considering a cloud connected dash cam. The newest addition to the Blackview dash cam lineup is connected by design with a built-in nano SIM card reader. The dash cam comes with a free Blackview app which allows you to connect to your dash cam directly or over the cloud. You can get impact notifications, download videos to your mobile phone, watch live view, and more. But that's not all. Blackview's new mobile hotspot function lets you turn your LTE dash cam into a Wi-Fi hotspot for up to five devices when on the go. Pair your cloud-connected dash cam with a parking mode accessory for peace of mind when you're away from your car. Blackview automatically switches to parking mode to monitor your parked vehicle. Thanks to the video buffer, the few seconds leading to triggering events are also recorded. And when paired with Blackview Cloud, parking mode lets your dash cam save event videos to the cloud in real time, just as they happen. So go to blackview.com gas and use the promo code gas to get 10% off any Blackview dash cam, free shipping for orders over $200. Thank you, Blackview. What's up? What's up, Wink Wink Nation? Hey, dude, don't <laughs> look. <laughs> toot toot. I'm getting a lot of DMs right now. Wink Wink Nation is ready to mobilize. I'm telling them to stand down. I don't want a war between us and you, okay? Okay. What's up, Wink Wink Nation? The name's Pumphrey. James Pumphrey. Uh, Nolan Sykes is in Seattle with his lovely bride. <laughs> <laughs> we started that now. Yeah. The rumor that he's married. Yeah, he's he's eating some chowder. Yeah, he chowder. He's throwing a fish. He's getting a cup of coffee. <laughs> he's throwing a fish as far as he can. He's a huge uh, Starbucks stand, and he had to see the birthplace of the shaken oat burnt sugar <laughs> ice latte. Uh, so I'm I got I got the wheel. Today, I'm behind the driver's nice. seat, and I'm joined by, uh, as always, Joe, <laughs> the Beast, <laughs> Weber. Hey, talk about, uh, yeah, Beast Mode is also a Seattle thing. Yeah, Beast Mode was named after you. <laughs> also, the character in the M. Night Shyamalan movie, uh, the Unbreakable sequel, The Beast, was based on you. Yeah. Um, I met M. Night Shyamalan at uh, the the tower in Seattle, the CN uh-huh. Tower, that's uh, Toronto. 
Uh, the space needle. The <laughs> space met, needle. Yeah, we met and we had a cup of coffee and had had some fish straight from the sound. And yeah, and he was like, "Surprise!" Yeah, and I was like, "I'm making a movie about you." You have to loop me in on these emails yeah. when you're talking about making a movie about my life. And he's like, "I'm sorry." <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was the whole conversation. At least he apologized. Yeah. I mean, that's so M Night, dude. That's so M Night. Yeah, it was a twist for sure. I thought he was yeah. not gonna dude. apologize, dude. M Night is like seriously twisted, and we have a special <laughs> treat. We have a special treat today. Uh, uh, he was on a couple weeks ago, and now he's he's filling in for Nolan today. He's filling in for me before, but Jer- the the ultimate we call him the dentist because he's always filling in. <laughs> Jeremiah Burton, host of Bumper to Bumper on Donuts YouTube channel, uh, my neighbor. That's right. We're we're neighbors now. Yeah, uh, we're both contributing to Inglewood's economy. That's right. Uh, we're homeowners. We have homes. We dig holes. We, <laughs> James and I have dug more holes in the last year than ever in my life. Yeah, speaking of um, Shia LaBeouf, no, we no one was. Jerry and I, Jerry and I have been digging a lot of holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one was talking about Shia. Isn't it weird in that movie that if you drink onion juice, the cobras don't come after you? Well, it's a pretty no- well-known fact that cobras hate onions, Joe. I hate onions. <laughs> That's a twist. I'm a cobra. I hate onions. No, you love no, onions. No, you don't. Dude. You told me you eat five onions a week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when we when I first got to donut, James was like, "Yeah, I eat like five onions a week," and everyone got quiet. And I was like, "No, the f- you don't." <laughs> <laughs> five onions is so many onions, James. Well, I like to be fair. I live with somebody, <laughs> so I I probably eat two and a half onions a week. But my house, my house goes through five onions a week. No, no, it's no sweat. An onion a day, fellas. <laughs> what are we talking? Cipollini onions or leeks even? Because like a normal white onion, that's a lot of onion. You guys got to understand. I also buy all my produce at the farmer's market. So an onion's about. Oh, so they're like tiny. Big, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I, cause I, you know, I take slices out of an onion and that'll last me a week and a half. Cause I always cut too much onion and I'm like, damn, that's way more than I wanted. No, man, you're not eating enough onions. You're going to get bit by a cobra. <laughs> you're going to get bit by a cobra, dude. Yeah. It's only a matter of time, Joe, before we're just getting attacked by cobras. Yeah. I, I wouldn't make a thinly veiled threats uh, against Wink Wink Nation uh, from Cobra Nation. Okay. That's all I'm saying. Uh, yeah, Cobra Nation versus Wink Wink Nation. Yeah. Yeah, better drink your onions, Wink Wink Nation. Because <laughs> Cobra Country. That's what I'm talking about when I say keep it juice. Is, I mean onion juice. <laughs> yeah, because you're scared of the venom. Uh, onions are also uh, a popular a popular addition to martinis, although our guy James oh, Bond yeah. probably only does uh, olives because I'm a big onion fan, but an onion in a drink sounds like I want to barf. It. I feel like, you know, he gets it shaken so that whatever, like, poison or whatever is more apparent in it, I'm assuming, right? There's no such thing as a stirred martini. It's all shaken? Yeah. I'm sure someone has stirred a martini before. Yeah, a lazy person. But if <laughs> if he gets, like, if he's so worried about getting poisoned... It's so easy to put a little pill inside of an olive. Yeah. If he was like really worried about getting poisoned, he would just like be a real dirt bag and like flask it everywhere. Like he just, <laughs> he just has yeah. like, like a Gatorade bottle full of gin. <laughs> he's like in Morocco in the casino yeah. or like yeah. Monaco. And he's just like. Yeah. <laughs> Like, he's like slightly <laughs> embarrassed. Yeah. It doesn't he's, deter him. He like goes to the bathroom and goes to the stall and just like chugs like three big gulps of gin. It's like really hot. Yeah. Because it's been in his trunk. Yeah. <laughs> or against his body the whole yeah, day. Yeah. It's like under his armpit. Why does it have to be a wouldn't Bond have a nice flask? I do like the visual of a like small baby Gatorade bottle though. That yeah. Would be good. yeah. I'm sure he would have a nice flask. What if Bond's drink was like what if he was like Diet Dr. Pepper and vodka? <laughs> uh, stirred with a finger. Yes, 
<laughs> in the can. <laughs> just yeah, he's like, instead of shaking out Sarah, it's like, dump out half the can. Just yeah. put the vodka in it. We should we <laughs> should redub sort of it. Around. Or like redub it, and on the parts where he's like, where it's like cutting to the bartender, we like yeah. redub it. And it's like, put your finger in it, stir it around. I want to see you cut your finger on the lip of the yeah. can. S- put it in the can, swirl it around. Like I want it just out of the little bottle, yeah. the little tiny bottle. Yeah. Just put it in the can, swirl it around like a bad stepdad. <laughs> <laughs> like you're gonna like you're gonna drop me off at practice. <laughs> what? <laughs> what a weird specific. Bond is turning into just like a f- southern alcoholic. Oh, he is totally an alcoholic. <laughs> He's also a sex addict. He's also like super weird. I can't believe they're still making these movies. 100% he's got cirrhosis of the liver. Oh yeah, and all the STDs. Yes. All of them. He has like he has like 4 HPVs. Yeah, not once did Q ever give him like sex advice or some sort of like. Don't put it on Q. Don't. That's come on. His engineer's got to help him out, man. He's got to be like, "Hey, Bond, <laughs> calm the f- down. Here's a prophylactic that is like. Yeah. Here's a gadget, Bond. That's <laughs> really just penicillin. <laughs> hey, you know you don't have to like <laughs> all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you okay, uh, dude? <laughs> are you all right? You get in his Aston Martin, there's like stains everywhere. <laughs> Sorry, he's like moving like his empty Gatorade bottles off the seat for you. <laughs> he's like going to like the bathroom on an airplane to like. <laughs> We're just creating a better version of Bond, I think. I think this. <laughs> yeah, I think a is... realistic version. We're pulling yeah, back. He's the got curtains. flaws. Let's yeah. lean into that. Yeah, dude, this is like the Christopher Nolan Bat uh, Batman right, Bond. Right. He's not all that suave. He he has a pocket. In the glove box of his ass and Martin. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Listen. like really nice leather on the inside. <laughs> He's a disgusting, weird pervert <laughs> that needs a therapist real, real bad. Yeah. All right, should we get into this or what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He also drove cars. <laughs> yeah, he drove a lot of cars. To really understand the partnership between the Bond film franchise and its history of cool cars, you have to understand the man who started it all. The author of the original Bond novels. Those are books. <laughs> They're like movies. For your, for your eyes. <laughs> for your, for your... <laughs> How did the author's ideas impact the films? And what changed from book to film? And what was it about the book, James Bond, that led to a film known for amazing cars? The original James Bond was created by the British author Ian Fleming. Fleming published the first Bond novel in 1953. The character of James Bond was loosely based on operatives Fleming met during World War II when he was in the Naval Intelligence Division, or NID. Fleming also based some of his villains on real-life people, including Arik Goldfinger, a famous architect at the time who Fleming apparently hated. (laughs) Oh, I hate his new building designs. Dude, like, what privilege do you have to be like, oh, I feel... I hate that famous architect. (laughs) When Eric found out, uh, he sued Fleming. And in response, Fleming almost changed the character's names to Gold Prick. Oh, nice. Which is British. Apparently, Fleming was as good at holding grudges as he was at writing thrilling spy novels. They also, when he was picking a name, he wanted it to be as boring as possible. And so he picked what he thought of as an accountant's name, James Bond. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's really interesting. It's a f***ing badass name. Yeah, and it's perfect for a spy because all you want to do is blend in. He's also a spy that ke- keeps introducing himself with his real name. <laughs> yeah. Like, he's ne- he's never yeah. like, Charlie Daniels. No. <laughs> he's not even like, my name's Jim Bond. Like, he's like a spy who, like, shows up and everyone's like, oh, there's that famous spy. Yeah, that, like, defeats the whole purpose of being a spy, is that exactly. people know you. He's just like a cop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, is James Bond just a cop? <laughs> he drinks like one, too. Gatorade bottle and all. <laughs> and he's got no problem hitting ladies. <laughs> Ian Fleming clearly had a knack for storytelling, but what made his books stand out were how cool he made James Bond. 
Even within the novels, a big part of Bond's mystique was his automobiles. Fleming himself was a car enthusiast, but his taste was a little different than the fictional spy he created. He owned everything from black two-door Buicks to a Morris Oxford saloon, and when Fleming sold the film rights for his Bond novels, he used the option money not to buy a classic British car, as you might assume. In 1955, with $6,000 in his pocket for selling the film rights to Casino Royale, he bought an all-black 1956 Ford Thunderbird with a hard and soft top. That's a rad car. It's funny to think of the author of maybe the most iconic British character buying maybe the most American car of the time. But the heart wants what the heart wants. The Bond of Fleming's novels, on the other hand, mostly drove Bentleys. There is mention of Bond driving an Aston Martin in just one novel, and it was this small mention that inspired the filmmakers and started an iconic partnership between spy and car. We know where the character of James Bond came from, and now we know a bit about his creator, but how and when did the franchise make the leap to film? And when did Aston Martin become the ultimate Bond car if it wasn't a part of the books? And who is the brains behind the operation? In 1961, producers Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Saltzman... (laughs) All right, come on, calm down, guys. (laughs) Both those guys have funny names. Well, you need salts on your broccoli. Well, what if his name was Harry Broccoli? That's an even better name. That ruins broccoli and hair for me. (laughs) Two Hollywood producers purchased the filming rights to Fleming's novels. Albert R. Broccoli is arguably the man who took James Bond from mildly popular book character to icon. Broccoli would produce the first Bond, Dr. No, and end up being involved with the series until his death. And to this day, Broccoli's children still run the Bond film franchise. In fact, the family has maintained creative control over the Bond franchise for all 25 movies. It was also under Broccoli's watch that the Aston Martin became the Bond car. But it took a few movies to figure out the magic formula. The first two James Bond films were Dr. No and From Russia with Love. Oddly enough, the first car Bond ever drove in the films was a 1957 Chevy Bel Air in Dr. No. Bond's car taste is all over the map in the first two films. He goes from the Bel Air to a Ford Ranch wagon. <laughs> I mean, that's that's like staying American. That's not super all over the yeah, board. Yeah, it's not all over the place. That's like <laughs> yeah. pretty similar. In, and in one scene in the movie, it's implied Bond's personal off-screen car is a Bentley 1938 3.5-liter drop-head coupe. Coupe. Doctor knows the one when he's in, like, Cuba, right? Yeah. I remember that. Sean Connery. Yeah, and he, he wears, like, some pretty thoughty... Uh, Swim trunks. (laughs) Yeah, he's like scuba diving or like snorkeling. Yeah, he's snorkeling in that one. You can see his outline kind (laughs) of. And then that one gal is wearing like the bikini with the belt and a knife. Oh, yeah, yeah. And my mom bought me like this like four movie Bond like VHS box set Mm -hmm. one night at the grocery store. It was like a Friday night, and uh, I I remember I like got like a bunch of like sandwich stuff. To, I was like in like fifth grade, and I got a bunch of sandwich stuff to like make like this like Dagwood sandwich. I was so stoked. I got these like movies. I was like watch movies and eat my sandwich. I remember seeing that gal with the bikini and the knife belt, and I was like, oh man, I think <laughs> I'm growing up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not interested in sandwiches anymore. (laughs) I made my own dinner, and also I think I know who I want to (laughs) marry. Also, like, isn't that like their first interaction of those two in the film, and they instantly start having sex with it? Like, yeah, my good friend Sam Brown uh, is like one of the funniest dudes I've ever met, and he. He describes James Bond. He's like, James Bond is a superhero, but his superpower is. <laughs> and he just like, he's just like, I don't know. Just like everyone wants to <laughs> him. And that's yeah. like, he's like, if you look at all the movies, that's like how he fixes everything as he like goes. And like, there's a lady who works for the bad guy. And then James Bond is like, well, you're going <laughs> to me. And then they, <laughs> and then she like betrays the bad guy. Yeah. 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 
big thank you to me undies for sponsoring this episode are you ready for mashed potato season aka turkey with gravy and cranberry sauce season aka every kind of pie and more season oh me undies is here with the softest and stretchiest undies in the game so you can be ready for seconds and thirds it's finally getting chilly here in la just a brisk 68 degrees i can't wait to get all cozy in my me undies they're super comfortable they're super cool looking i love them with adventurous prints to choose from and plenty of ways to match everyone in the family give your gratitude some attitude this thanksgiving season with me undies they have undies and loungewear made out of soft breathable stretchy fabrics that are perfect for everything from pre-dinner activities to post-dinner naps Seriously, you won't even care if the turkey's a little dry with undies this comfortable. Available in sizes extra small through 4XL and tons of styles, prints, and fabrics, Me Undies has a little something for everyone at the table. Me Undies has a great offer for our listeners. For any first time purchasers, you get 15% off and free shipping. Me Undies also has a promise if you're not satisfied with any product for any reason, you can return your order for a full refund within 45 days. To get 15% off your first order, free shipping, and a 100% percent satisfaction guarantee go to meundies.com slash past gas that's meundies.com slash past gas thank you me undies this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp online therapy check out betterhelp.com slash past gas everyone has stressful things in their lives whether it's traffic or your work or relationship stress You shouldn't feel weird about having stress in your life. It's normal. You should be able to work your way through it, unload it, get it out, talk to someone who's completely unbiased about your life, someone who isn't going to judge you or take sides on anything. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Unload the stressors and get some unbiased feedback and you'd be pretty surprised at what you might gain from it. See if it's for you. I think BetterHelp is an awesome alternative to traditional therapy. I think everyone should do therapy. I think it's great. Doesn't mean you're lesser of a person. I think it's really nice to not have to go into an office to do therapy. BetterHelp makes it so easy. You can match with a licensed therapist that is specialized in whatever you need. And I think that's great. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Pass Gas by Donut Media listeners. Get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash passgas. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash passgas. Thank you, BetterHelp. The first two Bond films did not create the now mystical concept of the Bond car, but they did set a precedent for the film franchise renting, borrowing, and building amazing vehicles to use during filming. When Broccoli and Saltzman did a screening of Dr. No for the... (laughs) Those two names together. That's like when you're like trying to get your toddler to eat his vegetables. It's like, here we go. Here's Mr. Broccoli with Saltzman. Uh, When those dudes did a screening of Dr. No for the studio execs, there was a complete silence afterwards. The bigwigs thought it was too weird and campy, but audiences loved the -the over-the-top spy. And the first two Bond movies did boffo numbers at the box office, proving that bigwigs don't know everything. A big part of the success was the charm of Sean Connery as the original Bond. He gave the character exactly what it needed, charm, suave, and a cool factor you can't teach. Diet Coke Fireball, Kool-Aid, and 11 cherries. <laughs> and put black lava salt on the rim. Yeah, you never see James Bond eat, right? Because it's No. Because all he does is drink. Yeah, there's a lot of calories in whatever he's drinking. <laughs> Just getting all his sustenance from Dr. Pepper. Yeah. There is one movie where James Bond, he like he's at a really fancy restaurant, and... He's eating with all these people and he's like trying to be like cool about it. And he just picks up a baked potato and eats it like an apple. (laughs) That's the one where he orders a steak well done with ketchup on the side. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, do you have chicken tenders? (laughs) Oh, you don't. I don't like this. It's too spicy. Jimmy needs his tendies. (laughs) Apparently, Sean Connery, like, didn't know how to use a fork. (laughs) Um, So, 
<laughs> it's just a thing left over from the Sean Connery bonds because like it made it into the movie, but yeah, he picked up a baked potato and he just ate it like an apple. Yeah. And if you look at all the other actors, they're like, yeah, it's a, it's a weird scene for sure. With the third installment of Bond, the producer Broccoli knew he needed to up the fun and excitement. Broccoli was once quoted as saying, We're not out to capture the Academy Awards as we go now. We're out to make entertainment. And Broccoli had some inspiration from the novels. A new Aston Martin was about to hit the market, and Broccoli would prove instrumental in getting the car into his picture. The movie was one of the most legendary of the Bond franchise's 27 films. Goldfinger. Goldfinger was the third film in the Bond series, and it is in this movie that Aston Martin makes its debut. Although the books had mostly featured Bentleys in the book version of Goldfinger, Fleming had written a brief scene with Bond in an Aston Martin DB Mark III. When the film went into production in 1963, Aston Martin had just introduced the DB5, and the producers knew the newer model was what they had to use in the film. Naturally. Yeah, but Albert Broccoli had a problem. His name was dumb, but also... (laughs) (laughs) Aston Martin was reluctant to lend out their cars to the campy James Bond movies. The special effects manager for the film, John Steers, persuaded Aston Martin to lend the new DB5 for filming, which wouldn't even be in showrooms at the time of the film's 1964 release. Aston Martin agreed and lent out two cars, an early production DB5 and a DB4 disguised to look like a DB5. But in order to get the DB5 they wanted for Goldfinger, the film's producers actually had to pay Aston Martin. This makes me want to watch Austin Powers. I know. I think it like there's probably going to be some jokes that you're like, huh, all right. <laughs> what was Austin Powers' car? That was a Jaguar, Shaguar. Yeah, the Shaggy R is a Type E. And then he had like a Mini Cooper. Elizabeth Hurley, huh? Wow, wow. Elizabeth Hurley. And the second one was a a Beetle. Oh, was it? Yeah, I remember. Like he's in the, he's ready to take off and he puts it in reverse and hits all the scientist equipment. (laughs) That guy, you know? Just like classic physical comedy with a car. The movie's funny, but there are a lot of jokes that are like, racist yeah of course while the db5 was impressive it was all the fictional spy gear bolted on its frame that captured people's imaginations in goldfinger james bond's db5 wasn't just any aston martin it's been specially upgraded by q bond's right hand gadget man the upgrades q made to the aston martin included twin browning machine guns that deployed from behind the front turn signals Rotating license plates. Jer, we know about those. Uh huh. Front and rear bumper rams, a bulletproof metal screen that rose behind the rear window, smoke screen and oil slick dispensers, radar and an in car telephone headset. You can make phone calls from the car. <laughs> Highly futuristic tech for 1960s. But maybe the most famous of the spy gadgets added to the DB5 was the passenger side ejector seat. (laughs) So Bond could easily get rid of a henchman without having to take his eyes off the road. I think the better plan is to not give henchmen rides in your car. (laughs) Like how often are your henchmen getting inside your car that you (laughs) need to develop a full-fledged ejector seat? Yeah. Yeah, just be like, I'm going the other way. That's not where I'm going. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't give you a ride. I, uh, I, There's like a, one doing... one tote bag on the seat. Sorry. <laughs> as you can see, uh, <laughs> can't give you a ride right now. I just kick all those Gatorade bottles. <laughs> <laughs> Even without spy gadgets, though, the DB5 is an amazing car. Contemporary critics praised it as an ideal version of of a grand touring car built for high speeds as well as long distance driving. It had a four liter all aluminum engine producing 282 horsepower, propelling it to 60 in eight seconds with a top speed of 145 miles per hour. I mean, that's pretty tight for the sixties, right? Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. All this while having a luxury interior and like legitimately it's one of the best looking cars ever made. And since every single car was handmade, 
only 1,059 were produced, making it an incredibly rare car to find. As elusive as James Bond himself. Well, I can think of one car that's even more rare than that, with only 1,012 examples. Uh, the Shiro 300ZX. That's Joe's car. Joe. Joe Weber. <laughs> it doesn't have quite the impact. Well, you gotta go Weber. Weber. Joe yeah. Weber. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Joe. Weber Joe. <laughs> and these are the type of people who drive Shiro C31. <laughs> yeah. That's Joe auditioning to go on a mission. <laughs> Goldfinger was a smash success. And if you consider the DB5 to be a co star in the film, its star meter went through the freaking roof. When Goldfinger premiered, Connery drove up the Champs Elysees in the movie's DB5, flanked by 60 women painted from head to toe in gold. Sean Connery went on to drive more Aston Martins throughout his time playing Bond, and the two became synonymous. The Scottish actor did drive a few other types of cars in the movies. One in particular was the Toyota 2000 GT Ooh. in You Only Live Twice, uh, one of the most beautiful cars yeah. ever made. In the movie, the car is driven by Aki, the Japanese SIS agent who helps Bond. It's her car, and she mostly drives it in the film, but Sean Connery still had to ride around in the petite two-door sports car. In fact, at six foot one, Sean barely fit in the 2000 GT, so two one-off topless models fitted with tonneau covers to simulate functioning convertible roofs were made specifically for the movie. At 6'1", he couldn't fit in that car. People, like, just 50 years ago were so much smaller. Yeah, whenever you see, like, you know, like, if you've ever been, like, the Smithsonian or the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and you see everyone's, like, suits. Yeah. Dude, I would, like, <laughs> if I could go back to the 20s, <laughs> I would be, like, the best wrestler in the world. I, I saw like, Steven Tyler at a at a Jewish deli and he's like five foot seven. Like he's petite. Yeah, he's really tiny. And he's got weird toes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's that's a different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Steven Tyler looks like somebody's stepmom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Apparently they considered using a Targa model, but Connery's head stuck out of the roof. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to make the fabricated convertible just two weeks before the movie because it looked goofy as hell. Toyotas aside, Connery as Bond driving the Aston Martin cemented in audiences' minds who Bond was and what car he drove. Remember how Aston Martin initially didn't want to allow their cars to be featured in the film? Well, that all changed with Goldfinger. The DB5 was priced a little under 100 k in today's dollars, and after Goldfinger, sales went up. The company got another bump in sales from the DB5's cameo in Thunderball. And again, when the larger DBS coupe was shown on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Aston Martin knew they had a good thing going, but the Bond franchise hadn't figured that out yet. After all that success, you would think that the Bond-Aston Martin partnership would be set in stone. Put James Bond in an Aston Martin, sales of the car go up, popularity of the movies go up, End of story. But just like with M. Night, there's always a twist. After Sean Connery left as Bond, the studio wanted to differentiate between Bonds. This makes sense considering this was the first time the studio was having a new actor play the iconic James Bond. Although we're used to it now, this was much more of a novel concept for the film at the time. The studio probably thought that audiences would need help telling their Bonds apart, they also suffered a critical misfire with the casting of George Lazenby for only a single film in the series on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Lazenby was a model with no acting experience, and the movie was panned, although today some consider it an underrated classic. Those people are wrong. I don't think I've ever seen this one. Have you guys? No, I haven't. I guess I passed judgment on it before I even saw it, so... <laughs> <laughs> I'm no better than George Lazenby. <laughs> How many has Daniel Craig done? Four? I think this will be his fifth. Oh, whoa. All right, can you list them? James, go. Speed round. Okay, No Time to Die. <laughs> Casino Royale. Um, um, Like you're, you're by yourself, you're meditating. 
uh, alone with the wish. <laughs> 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 yep, yep, keep going. Um, You're on a roll, baby. Uh, give me a hint. Um, you look through glasses, but you call them something else. Oh, discover the queen's wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's not what I'm going with. Um, it's like like you're a real fancy guy, and you put one of them up to your eye. Uh, monocles corral. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Another big thank you to our sponsor this week, Blackview Dash Cams. Have you ever worried about your car when you leave it at a valet parking or when you bring it to a shop or dealership? Well, with the Blackview DR750X2CH LTE Plus, it's not a concern anymore. The dual channel Blackview Dash Cam comes with both front and rear cameras. You can enjoy clear image quality day and night thanks to the full HD Stony StarViz image sensors with a super wide 139 degree view angle. That's a wide angle, my friend. If you're considering a dash cam connected to the cloud, well, Blackview's newest LT dash cam is what you really need. The latest addition to the Blackview dash cam lineup is connected by design with a built-in nano SIM card reader as well. This is great stuff. I really, really want one of these. The dash cam comes with a free Blackview app, which allows you to connect your phone directly to the dash cam or over the cloud. You can get impact notifications. You can download videos to your phone. You can watch live. Also, Blackview's got a new hotspot function that lets you turn your LTE dash cam into a Wi-Fi hotspot for up to five devices when on the go. That's so cool. That means if you're taking your friends somewhere, they can be connected to the internet and not use their data. Very convenient. And now your friends will want to ride with you. You can also pair your cloud connected dash cam with a parking mode accessory for peace of mind when you're away from your car, okay? This is how it works. Blackview automatically switches to parking mode to monitor your parked vehicle. And thanks to the video buffer, the few seconds leading up to triggering events are also recorded. And when paired with Blackview Cloud, parking mode lets your dash cam save event videos to the cloud in real time just as they happen, super convenient. So, if this sounds good to you, I know it does to me, go to blackview.com slash gas, that's blackvue.com slash gas, and use promo code gas to get 10% off any Blackview dash cam with free shipping for orders over $200. How awesome is that? Thank you, Blackview, for sponsoring our show. Big thanks to Gabby for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. It's crazy how fast the prices of just about everything are rising. Gas, groceries, clothes, you name it. And all the experts are saying it's going to get worse before it gets better. I've been looking at all the ways I could personally cut costs, ways to save where I can, and I started with my auto insurance. I started with Gabby. Shopping for auto insurance sucks, but everyone has to do it, so I get it. So does Gabby. That's why they do all the work for you. Things that would take days or weeks, Gabby does in just minutes. Gabby uses your current policy to compare your current coverage with 40 of the top insurance providers like Nationwide or Travelers. They're the one true comparison platform with fast, verifiable quotes, not ballpark guesses. I really like that about Gabby. I don't want to be yanked around with ballpark guesses. I want a solid quote when I'm shopping for insurance. And that's why I love Gabby so much. They give you not only one quote, they give you a, a bunch of quotes from many different providers. You can compare, contrast, and pick the right policy for you. I went to Gabby to look for a new insurance policy and I put my current insurance provider in and it turns out that I actually could save money for the same coverage if I switched. And that's why Gabby's so important. People who switch with Gabby save on average $80 a month versus their current policy. $80, what do you spend $80 on per month? New vans plus shipping? Uh, it's not just me who loves Gabby. Gabby has been featured in TechCrunch, Forbes, and USA Today. Start saving on your auto insurance today. Go to gabby.com slash gas to start saving. It's totally free. That's G-A-B-I dot com slash gas. Gabby.com slash gas. Thanks, Gabby. After this point, Bond's producers and writers were determined to relaunch the franchise with an all-new Bond. Uh, not your grandma's Bond. <laughs> a Bond for the swinging 70s, groovier than the gruff Bond of the 60s. This meant veering away from the classics. Not only did Roger Moore smoke cigars instead of cigarettes and use a different type of handgun, he also would never drive Bond's signature Aston Martin. Moore did get to drive some cool cars, though. Again, to make Bond seem new and fresh, but still terminally British, they put him behind the wheel of a white Lotus Esprit S1. This is 
one of my favorite Bond cars. Is it? Is this the underwater one? The Wet Nelly, baby. Oh uh, yeah, Elon Musk owns it. But what was happening to Aston Martin because of this parting of ways? All through the 60s, Aston Martin would get a bump in sales and marketing with every James Bond movie that came out. In fact, after Goldfinger, sales of the DB5 went way up. Aston Martin was a small company, but was able to turn out a highly respectable 1,000 of the premium priced units before moving on to the DB6. When Thunderball came out and then Honor Majesty's Secret Service, the company got two more boosts. When Moore took over and Bond became more of a Lotus guy, Aston Martin started hurting a little bit. In general, the 1970s were tough on boutique automakers. There's a global energy crisis, new new environmental regulations, and a recession. People weren't exactly lining up to buy luxury spy cars. This, combined with the loss of the free marketing from the Bond franchise, meant Aston Martin got into financial trouble, and they were forced to sell to an investor group for only 101 pounds in 1972. 101 pounds. What? That's like an insult. They must have had so much debt. (laughs) Yeah. Dude, that's what I weigh. Just like when the F1 team Braun GP was sold for one British pound, David Brown Limited needed to offload the heavily indebted company, leading them to sell Aston Martin for only 101 British pounds. The loss of the Bond partnership continued to hurt the company, and in 1975, only a few years after buying Aston Martin, David Brown Limited sold the almost bankrupt Aston Martin to another group of investors. This group tried to modernize Aston Martin by introducing the V8 Vantage and the convertible Volante. But even this couldn't save the company and controlling shares of the company were sold again, this time to a British oil magnate and car enthusiast named Victor Gauntlet, awesome name, who became chairman. Oh yeah. Gauntlet helped the company launch more products. But what he really did to help with the failing business was get the car back into the movies. You gotta get back into pictures, kid! Gotta get back up there, kid. That's what's gonna set us up hot. Also, uh, I like that they launched more products, but this is like what, like a coffee maker? Like <laughs> when we did that D-list, James, where like yeah. Porsche makes a hookah. Porsche and Bentley make hookahs. Yeah. Whoa. They're thousands of dollars. When Moore retired as Bond after notching seven titles in the franchise, Timothy Dalton, who looks like a poor man's British... Uh, John Travolta took over as the world's favorite British spy. And with a new bond came a new crop of cars. And yes, the studio realized that they needed to put bond back in an Aston Martin. Timothy Dalton brought on a new era of bond and a new era of bond cars. But what made the studio want to go back to the classic Aston Martin? Moore was gone as Bond, and the franchise was ready to get back to the classics. Dalton even said he thought Moore's Bond was a bit too campy, and he wanted to play the character more grounded and real. I agree that Roger Moore Bonds are so goofy. This change in Bond also meant the producers could change up the cars. No more Lotus for James. Timothy Dalton, in his first Bond flick, The Living Daylights, drove a V8 Vantage. But not just any V8 Vantage. It is an upgrade from Connery's DB5 with spike-producing tires, missiles, lasers, signal-intercepting smart radio, rocket propulsion, and a built-in self-destruct feature. (laughs) I thought all British cars came with one of those. Oh, zing, zing. It was also a hardtop convertible, so Bond could enjoy fresh air while shooting lasers. After being featured in The Living Daylights, Aston Martin once again got attention from consumers and, i.e., they got big business. The great press and increased sales got the attention of Ford, which would lead to Ford eventually buying and assuming majority ownership of Martin by 1991. The relationship between Ford and Aston Martin would help modernize and grow the company. It led to more models, including the DB7, Vantage, and the DB9. Things were looking up for Aston Martin, and the relationship between the automaker and the film franchise was going well. But what came next is what would solidify the relationship between Aston Martin and Bond for the next several decades. The man behind the Bond film franchise, Broccoli, (laughs) knew what made the spy film special, and he knew the right car was key. He also knew how to market and sell a movie, which meant a lot of corporate sponsorship. 
1995, Broccoli signed an exclusive product placement deal with BMW for the next three Bond movies. Oh, yeah. I know this era. Yeah, dude. Pierce Bray is in with the Z3? No, it's not just a car for secretaries. No, it's a Z8. Well, it is Z8 in one of them, but they debuted the Z3 in uh, Goldfinger. Oh, nice. Hop in. Halle Berry, right, guys? Halle Berry. Halle Berry. Halle Berry. Halle. Hallelujah. Yeah, the Z8. I remember, yeah, didn't they saw it in half in the movie? Oh, yeah, yeah. Fans were not happy about the BMW partnership. They saw Bond as the ultimate British spy, and everything he touches should stay distinctly British. Even when the producers switched up cars for Roger Moore's Bond, he was still driving British cars. Bond driving a German BMW did not work for many fans. I mean, <laughs> Germany bombed the <laughs> out of Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, Broccoli uh, apparently knew what he was doing. And while having a sponsorship deal with BMW for those three movies, which all heavily feature Beamers, the producers of Bond still managed to slip a DB5 into every one of the films. It gets sawed in half and then it's a DB5 underneath. <laughs> <laughs> And this worked out in the long run for both Aston Martin and the Bond franchise. By 2002, Ford owned Aston Martin and had the money and backing to take back the franchise from BMW. So the ultimate Beamer Bond, Pierce Brosnan, finally in a die another day, Aston Martin became the official Bond car once again. Starting with Timothy Dalton in the early 90s, Aston Martin was back in the spy game. Woo! And with Die Another Day in 2002 and Pierce Brosnan, the deal was done. Aston Martin was James Bond's car. It was also in the early 2000s that Aston Martin realized they could really market their cars and Die Another Day was the first time since the 80s that Bond was driving a car you could actually buy granted without the lasers. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because I guess the DB5 is like a classic. They did, like, uh, HKS made some, like, aftermarket lasers, I think, for this car. <laughs> Which right? is weird because they're, they're a Japanese company. Yeah, super weird. After Dalton left and our modern Bond, Daniel Craig, took over, the Aston Martin streak stayed. Unlike with previous Bond actor transitions, no one felt the need to change up Craig's cars. In fact, the director of Skyfall, Sam Mendes, brought back Connery's DB5 to add some nostalgia to the film. That was a good, good choice in my mind. Oh, Skyfall was good. Yeah, Skyfall was really good. That was the one I couldn't remember. Was that the one with Javier? Javier. <laughs> what are you from Florida? <laughs> Javier, caviar. Javier, bar down. <laughs> in Casino Rail, we get to see the origin story of Bond winning his original DB5 in a poker game. Mendez even said in interviews that his love of the Bond asked Martin goes way back. The DB5 was part of my boyhood, and it's part of my generation's boyhood. I had the toy with the ejector seat, and I lost the little man that flew out and spent the rest of my childhood looking behind, looking for him. Then I spent the rest of my childhood looking for him behind various sofas. You have no idea how many sofas <laughs> I looked behind, but I never found the little man. Where's the little man? If anybody out there in Radio Land has found my little man, you can email him to no. me. No, okay. Let's just, <laughs> that's a creative license taken with Sam Mendes' quote right no, there. No, dude. Literally, sammendes at gmail.com. <laughs> James sounded a little bit like Adam Sandler. He'd be like, oh, wash a water up. Mixed with like Quentin Tarantino, yeah. but less energetic. <laughs> that's a quote. Okay. Mendez brought it back full circle. And now it seemed like Daniel Craig will be driving an Aston Martin in the upcoming Bond film, No Time to Die, including, you guessed it, the DB5. I think that he's going to drive a Valkyrie at some point in that movie. Because that's the, you know, ne next logical set. Well, it comes out today. Oh, let's go see it. We should go see it. Yeah. The company itself is doing well, and we will just have to wait to see how the new Bond movie does, which this will air probably three weeks from now, so you guys probably have a better understanding. But, his, the, but this partnership seems to be in it for the long haul. Of course, the actual cars used for filming now have stories of their own. 
In 2019, one of the original Aston Martin DB5 used for filming Goldfinger sold at auction for $6.4 million. These auctions and private sales happen all the time. But what about when one of these million dollar movie icons is stolen? There's one car from Goldfinger that has been missing for some time. An American businessman, Anthony Pugliese, who is an avid car collector and Bond fan, bought one of the original four DB5s, the chassis number DP216-1 to be exact, used for filming in Goldfinger. In fact, it was the only one of the prop cars that still had working gadgets. He bought it for $275,000 in 1986 at a Sotheby's auction. That's actually not bad. No, that's good. In 1986, that's a shit load of money, though. Yeah. And that's like before like the market really presented itself. Like right now, like the idea of cars uh, selling for like millions of dollars is like not, it's relatively new. Like the idea of investing in cars is like a relatively new idea. Especially movie cars. Like, what was the, what didn't they just sell um, Paul Walker's Supra? Yeah. And it went for like, I can't remember what it was, but yeah, like million, millions of dollars. Nuts. Yeah, I bought it. <laughs> in June of 1997, the car was stolen from the Boca Raton airport in Florida where it was being stored. It was inside a locked hangar when someone sliced through the molding on the hangar door, cut the metal latch, and sniped the alarm wi- and snipped the alarm wires. Maybe it was James Bond himself. Whoa. At the time, Pugliese said he couldn't understand why anyone would steal the car. It would be hard to resell because it was one of the prop cars that included many of Connery's original spy gadgets. Very identifiable. The car had pop-out machine guns, pop-out up and down machine guns, <laughs> tire shredders, smoke screen funnels, and a water slash oil sprayer. Basically a bunch of stuff that screams, hey, this is this is actually that one guy's Aston Martin that got stolen. Something was then loaded onto a cargo plane and taken out of the U.S. entirely. The thieves also seemed to have the spy car specifically in mind because the hangar included other priceless historic cars including a roadster owned by amelia Earhart. amelia Earhart was known for driving cars around the world Mm -hmm. the story gets even more wild from there when authorities started investigating the case some accused pugliese of having his car stolen for the insurance money i mean Joe, I don't want to speak to your Italian heritage too much, but with a name like Pugliese. Yeah, I mean we Ponzi. Ponzi is an Italian name. Like we're yeah, yeah. we're scam goddesses, dude. Uh, why would anyone want to steal a car? I don't know. Let's go get some gravy. A clue to the current origins of the car has come from an unlikely place. A podcast hosted by famed English actress Elizabeth Hurley, uh, Jeremiah's (laughs) ex-wife. The show titled The Most Famous Car in the World tracked down the car in the Middle East where eyewitnesses report seeing a car with matching VIN numbers. According to their sources, the Aston Martin is stashed in a private collection in either Saudi Arabia Dubai, Kuwait, or Bahrain. Okay. So I'm glad they were able to <laughs> narrow that down to only four countries. Yeah. Isn't it funny? It's like, yeah. hey, people <laughs> saw the VIN number, which is very specific, yeah. but they don't remember what country they were in. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. God. well yeah. definitely not Saudi. Jeez. We're not going to bomb any of those guys. We're not even going to investigate if it's in Saudi Arabia. Much like the Fast and Furious franchise, cars often serve as a form of character development in the Bond world, including for the bad guys. In GoldenEye, the henchwoman Xenia Anatop drives a Ferrari F355 GTS. Allegedly filming the chase scene between the Ferrari and Bond's DB5 caused over $80,000 worth of damage because of how tricky both cars were to handle driving through the steep, windy roads of Monaco. And in Never Say Never, a villainess known as Fatima Blush drives a red Renault R5 Turbo. There is one brand, however, that is considered the baddie car within the franchise. The Jaguar. It's kind of like life imitating art. In real life, there's a long-running rivalry between Jaguar and Aston Martin. 
which makes it even more fun that it's now considered canon for Bond villains to drive Jags. Jaguar even used this in a famous marketing campaign claiming, Bad guys drive Jags. The baddie Jag first appeared in Die Another Day with a villain, Zhao, driving a gun-equipped Jaguar XKR. It's been featured in the newest iteration of Bond with many of Daniel Craig's nemeses in Driving Jags. <laughs> Inspector, Bond is in a chase scene being followed by a Jaguar CX-75, but the CX-75 was prototyped and never went into production. Well, it was canceled because they listened to some of its old podcasts. <laughs> that joke never gets old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They read some of its old tweets. The CX-75 was used in filming Spectre, but Jaguar switched the electrified powertrain for a supercharged 5-liter V8 rated at 550 horsepower. They actually put a Coyote engine there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this fantasy car raced through Rome chasing Bond's Aston Martin DB10. Watching this chase scene will make you wish the Jag had gone into production. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish it. Oh, I wish I wish. <laughs> I wish I wish I wish. <laughs> I wish, I wish, I wish my oh, I wish this electric Jaguar crossover made it to production. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> if only this one car was made, I'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'll never be happy. Bond is synonymous with cool, stylish, thrilling. And that is exactly what Aston Martin has made their brand of cars out to be. But looking back, which came first, the car or the spy? Well, the car did, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you can look at it. They, they write that <laughs> shit down. I think it's more, the question is more, who saved who? Uh, the Broccoli family has held on to controlling shares of the Bond franchise for over 50 years. And even when Albert Broccoli died, he passed his shares onto his two children. Cauliflower and cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> Brussels. Brussels. And, and ice. My and name ice is Iceberg <laughs> Br Brussels Broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> and the Broccoli family knows how to keep the Bond name thriving. I mean, they're doing a really good job, honestly. Meanwhile, Aston Martin has had a rotating cast of owners and board members and been thrown into financial turmoil more than once. The two brands, Aston Martin and Bond, may have been run differently through the years. And they may not have always been on the same page, but one thing is true. If a franchise can last for over 50 years and become one of the top grossing film franchises of all time while switching actors and directors, it seems like it's constants that make the film stick. The martinis, the action, the beautiful locations, the ladies with swimsuits and belts, and most importantly, the cars. If we went through every single car ever driven by the world's favorite spy, which is, again, cancels out the whole idea of a spy. The world should not have a favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> but if we went through every single car driven by the world's favorite spy, we would be here for a week. But the Bond films are at their best when they rely on the classic swagger of Connery's original portrayal of the role. And a big part of that swagger comes from Aston Martin. Aston Martin knew it. Albert Broccoli knew it. The fans knew it. And now it seems to be canon, set in stone. Who knows what will happen when Daniel Craig steps down? Maybe we'll see a whole new Bond, a modern Bond, driving something totally different. But we hope not, because this brand partnership is one of the original, longest-lasting, beloved pairings in film and car history. It's the Home Alone and Pepsi of cars. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so big announcement, big, big announcement. Um, I'm not supposed to say this. I don't think I'm allowed to say this, but the real reason that Nolan is not here is because Nolan is the new James Bond. Oh yeah. <laughs> nice. Congrats, Nolan. He he earned. It. Yeah, so he deserves the new James it. Bond yep. is actually um, Nolan, but in this version, Nolan is a gadget. He is he's a, <laughs> he's a fighting robot um, that Timothy Chalamet mm -hmm. wears to fight. So Nolan is the new James Bond, but he's basically playing Timothy Chalamet's Iron Man suit. 
He wears a flat brim 805 hat the whole time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a new take. It's a new take. But yeah. <laughs> 805 mixed with Red Bull uh, or Mon- uh-huh. Monster. Yeah, in this version, uh, <laughs> James Bond is from a Tascadero. Yeah. <laughs> Where he mixes his energy and beer. He's never had like a, a fish fillet before, only like fish sticks. <laughs> yeah. He's, and he dri- he's not driving an Aston Martin. I, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but he is driving a Duramax. <laughs> <laughs> and it rolls so much coal so much coal that's the yeah. only get it, that it rolls <laughs> he's like how do we get away don't worry I, 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 <sighs> yeah. there's uh, you know how there's always like a bad guy that jumps on the car <laughs> always it's like not great for Nolan as Bond because like 17 <laughs> bad guys jump in the bed of his truck and he has to fight like all these guys while he's yeah but Timothy Chalamet is just like and then Nolan goes into drone mode and flies <laughs> out and fights all the guys while Timothy Chalamet drives. You know, we'll see how this does when it hits market, but I, it's a I big some, swing, man. Yeah, it's, a it's a big, big swing. swing. I wish him the best. I'm really proud of him. He started as an intern at Donut, moved up to Donut Host, and now he's the fighting robot mech suit James Bond. Pretty amazing. That will solidify his name in the history books. Yeah. What kind of gun would Nolan have? I feel like Nolan would have um, just, just like, like a, a sawed off, <laughs> yeah, sawed off shotgun, <laughs> but with a silencer on it or an AR-15. Yeah. He said, "I 3D printed this." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also like uh, this Bond is in uh, Heath Ledger Joker makeup the whole time. Yeah, that's the weird, weirdest choice to me is yeah. like the green hair, mm-hmm. purple suit. Anyway, we'll see what the traditionalists think. I feel like we've created at least three different potential spinoffs of Bond in this podcast that all would be pretty yeah. fun. Oh, and, and and in this movie also he goes by Jim. Oh, heck yeah. Jim Bond. And that's how he says it. Jim. My name's Jim. <laughs> Jim, Jim Bond. Bond. <laughs> My name's Bond. Jim Bob Bond. <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys, for listening to uh, uh, Past Gas. I hope I did a good job with Nolan out filming James Bond. He'll be back next week because the movie only takes three minutes to film, or uh, three days to film. Uh, <laughs> Jeremiah, thank you so much for guesting in. Thanks for having Where me. can we find you on social? Yeah, thanks, Jeremiah. At Jeremiah Burton on everything, right? At Jeremiah Burton and uh, TikTok, Silence of the Lambda. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. They banned my other one, which was Suck My Science. They wouldn't let people search oh, for that. Oh, shoot. Yeah, that was good, too. Science of the Lambda is kind of creepy. Follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Follow me at James Pumphrey. Um, tell a friend about this podcast if you if you liked it, because really, word of mouth is how people hear about stuff. Uh, if you don't know, we have a YouTube channel, Donut Media. Uh, we have also have t-shirts and stuff uh you can go to donutmedia.com to check those out let us know if you want a pass gas shirt yeah eventually that'd be cool if you got any questions or you want to correct us on anything or just like yell at us or whatever you can email us at passgas at donutmedia.com i love you keep it juiced bye for now wink quick nation no dude what cobra army wa- rise up <laughs> <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.